It is common to hear complementary judgments about the naturalness or lack of artifice of certain artistic objects, a certain nearness to nature or to a natural way. Nature as a praise uh, and an aesthetic merit, even as a kind of authenticity. And as I will try to show, this naturalness is often, though not always, closely related to claims of mitigation, declination, or rejection of personal authorship, and even of intentionality, usually in favor of nature or other uh, non-human forces, as sui generis cut holders of the creative act. I want to explore briefly in this talk the provenance of uh, these attributions and dismissals and the degree of currency of these claims in certain, certain kinds of music today, musical improvisation in particular. I will not talk about authorship as a legal issue, but only as an ordinary, complex sometimes, role of our uh, musical practices. One of the first problems when approaching this topic is, of course, where we should draw the boundaries between the natural and the artificial. In Aristotle, for instance, we find an attempt to distinguish things that exist by nature from things that exist by art. Uh, the principles of change of the first group would be internal, while artistic things would come to exist by the intentional hand of an external agent. Of course, there are many other ways of making this distinction. Kant uh, claims that a human being is a rational being opposed to a natural being, but he also talks about a kind of nature outside of us and the nature inside of us. Anyway, for my actual proposals, I will stick to a way proposed by John Stuart Mill. Mill considers two meanings of nature. The first, maybe nature would be all that there is, and the second, nature would be what is not humanly intentional. I will stick to the, to the latter, to the second one, since I think it is this short of nature uh, that has been most uh, commonly present in our talk about art. As a point of departure, we may accept, in principle, that nature produces or generates organisms while humans create artifacts in a broad sense of non-natural objects. However, from ancient times, uh, there always has been a tendency to conflate both sides. There always has been a tension between machines and organisms, so to speak. We humanize nature. Uh, we tend to humanize nature, as I have just made, saying that nature produces or generates, and naturalize human creation. The fascination of the machine or artifact that comes to life seems to be a perennial archetype. In the arts of our Western tradition, we all could mention countless examples from the rhythmic of uh, Pygmalion and Galatea to uh, the golem of Frankenstein. But it seems certain that in the quest for the natural in the arts, music has been always, in a certain sense, a privileged field because of its lack of fixity, its uh, transient, fluid, and, and repeatable condition. One interesting case of this phenomenon uh, is musical organicism. A way to approach musical creation and a discourse about music that arises in romanticism and claims that music or a musical piece is a living organism or is like a living organism. There has always been, as we show, an oscillation between the metaphorical to the literal. Or from the weak thesis to the strong thesis. To understand the emergence of organicism, some authors uh, have stressed uh, the relevance of the concept of expression, drawing a simplified historical picture since from the visual culture of the Baroque in the 17th century and the first half of the 18th century, when music would be approached through uh, terms of visual arts, uh, Music would be seen as painting. Through the 18th century, when classical music is seen as language, understood as an artifice capable of representation, up to the 19th century, in which music comes to be considered mainly as expression. 
and consequently, music tends to be personified, seen as a living being or an organism. And approaching terms borrowed from biology or botany, we could understand the transition from classicism to romanticism as a passage from representation to expression, or in other words, from mechanicism to organicism. So since the 19th century, there has been a widespread tendency to talk about artworks, and in particular musical works, as if they were sentient entities. In principle, of course, we usually don't believe the works, the work of art, of art have feelings. So this brings about the well-known problem of expression in art. That is to say, how is it possible for a work of art if we agree that it is an artifact to express an emotion? But this also raises another problem, reading the puzzle from the organist's side. How is it possible for, a, for an artist, for a human being, to create living organisms? We could choose between two answers here. None of them is really an answer, but we could choose uh, about two ways of trying to answer this, this problem. The first, they, uh, the musical works are not really living organisms, but artifacts. However, we could just pretend that they are organisms. This is a weak, it would be the uh, weak claim of organicism. And the second one, the second answer, they are living organisms, but, but since humans cannot create such items, the artist is not exactly the creator, but the vehicle of forces or entities to which we use to attribute the power of creating living things nature, deities, and the like. This second view is closely related to the concept of genius, a common position that under different guises has survived through romanticism and modernism until the present day. Uh, sometimes unspoken or not fully articulated. Among the main influences of this uh, phenomenon of musical organicism, we should mention the philosopher Immanuel Kant not only uh, for his famous doctrine of genius as an intermediary or medium of nature. Besides this, Kant asserts in some passages of his critic of judgment a preeminence of nature over artifice, or rather a preeminence of the beauty of nature over the beauty of art, and the moral superiority of the appreciator of natural beauty over the appreciator of artistic beauty. One of the reasons why art's beauty is not moral as nature's beauty, and therefore one of the reasons why the artifact is inferior to the natural or found object, is that art is an imitation of nature. Art is deceptive. So art pretends to be alive, but it is not, says Kant. And as long as romantic art, in general terms, wants to be moral, to be seen as a road to redemption, we could say that organicism is going to emerge partly from this feeling of dissatisfaction or as an attempt to answer this problem. Uh, though the most common approach to organicism is to consider it as a romantic metaphor against the Enlightenment's rational and mechanistic worldview, what begins as a metaphor or simulation, that is, a musical world is like a living organism or it should seem a living organism, what begins as, as this simulation ends, in some relevant cases, as a literal claim. After Kant, August Schlegel, in the first years of the uh, 19th century, um, talks about a form that is mechanical when a certain influence is imparted to a material from the outside, and an organic form that unfolds itself from within independently of any external agent. A little bit later, uh, there are many examples. Coleridge, famously called Shakespeare, nature humanized, and nature the prime genial artist. In all these sorts of expression, we often see what uh, the author, uh, Mayer Howard Abrams has called natural supernaturalism, but we rather call uh, supernatural naturalism. Romantic and organicist nature is an idealized entity with a moral behavior. 
biological that transcend them. Uh, in the very realm of musical discourses, we have countless expressions of, of this kind of, of talk. Uh, Adolf Marx in the 19th century says, I'm, I'm quoting, Music is not a rough dead mechanism that only constitutes constitute machines, but a live organism that acquires life and stimulates living work, living development. Another author, August Holm. Musical themes have inherent laws. A theme itself will tell us whether it is well grown, not the author. Or Guido Adler, in the first years of, uh, in the uh, 20th century. Music is an organism or a sum of musical, or, or a sum of individual organisms. Uh, not surprisingly, Heinrich Schenker, the most relevant theorist of organicism, was very interested in improvisation. In fact, in fact, I think organicism is closely related to a naive conception of improvisation as a natural or artless practice, opposed to a allegedly real artificially crafted and composed music. In this sense, and to some extent, certain discourses about modern improvisation as a genre follow the path of romantic ideology. But it is also important the fact that a misguided, what I think is a misguided notion of improvisation plays an important part in the birth of organicism itself. At the first st stage of his work, Heinrich Schenker claims that music just should seem natural, as Kant had said before him. Must appear not artificial, not artificial, but like a product of nature, like something created not by rational men, but by an unconscious natural process. But what seems significant here is that Schenker, Schenker's thesis has a relevant implication that the worked out composition must aspire ultimately to sound as something whose features coincide with his misguided view of improvisation. That is, something non-deliberate, non-regulated, something natural, which is still, to a certain extent, our received view of improvisation, what some of us have called precisely the romantic view of improvisation, the romantic ideology of improvisation. But later, in the second stage of the work of Schenker, Schenker claims that Music is natural, stressing the biological factor in the life of tones, arguing that, I'm quoting, tones have lives of their own, independent of the artist. And the musical material has an inherent natural will or independence. As a consequence, I find here a claim of mitigation of authorship and intentionality. Another quotation of Schenker in a famous passage based uh, on his particular reading of Kant's notion of genius. Schenker writes, a great talent or mind of genius, like a sleepwalker, often finds the right way. The superior force of truth of nature is at work, mysteriously behind his consciousness, without caring in the least whether the happy artist himself want to, wanted to do the right thing or not. Paradoxically, and despite all the invasive presence of the composer throughout the romantic musical tradition, one of the targets, the targets of organicism is to testify that the composer has not been there. Or maybe that the composer has been the sheer intermediary of a superior force. In other words, the beginning of the cult of the composer is also the moment of the birth of this strange authorial absenteeism. Of course, this mediumness has a, a lot to do uh, with priesthood <laughs> and with music having been endowed with this remarkable religious value, with this, uh, this notion of art as religion that has spread throughout the Western world from Germany uh, in the last two centuries, with these churches, sacred texts, martyrs, promises of redemption and the like. In fact, I think that it is this equation musician, art, uh, musician, priest, along with the biological stuff, what has contributed most in bringing about these claims of mitigation or, or rejection of 
uh, human authorship in certain areas of Western music. Organicism is also present in modernism. And sometimes uh, uh, some authors uh, defend that uh, organicism is a romantic phenomenon, but I think it's beyond romanticism. Organicism is also present in modernism as a way of asserting the superiority of nature over artifice. Weber, Arnold Weber, for instance, a strong influence for many contemporary improvisers, writes, what we regard as an artwork and called by that name is basically nothing other than a product of nature. And Bartok's moral superiority, superiority of folk, could be perfectly seen as another example of a preeminence of nature over culture. Indeed, in, in these first years of the 20th century, uh, some of these claims of naturalness, naturalness lay the foundation of a will of continuity, continuity between nature and art. And the logical outcome of the story, I think, is the object trouvé, the found object. Schenker's pretended organicity, or pretended or real, or pretended organicity and, or naturalness, his yearning for spontaneity and for presenting a musical object apparently untouched by human, by human hand, prefigures the objet trouvé. Therefore, ironically, in this second modernism, as I mentioned before, the cult of the composer tends to culminate in a pseudo disappearance, in a theatrical sidestep of the composer himself, of the composer herself. A, moment, a movement, in theory at least, a movement towards the declination of intentionality and authorship. We all know the famous words of uh, John Cage, for instance, let the sounds be themselves. Or, uh, to put another example, uh, these words, uh, by Pierre Boulet, uh, comments on one of his works. I didn't choose the elements, I'm quoting, so I had no influence on the material. The material already was there. The material develops by itself. I interfered the least in it. End of the quote. That is to say, a lethal combination of animism and authorial absenteeism. I'm inclined to think that certain discourses on, on improvisation feed on part of this legacy of modernism. In other words, free improvisation has sometimes wanted to construe itself in the image of this problematic object trouvé, as, as if they there were actually any object trouvé as a natural object. This way, the philosopher Alessandro Bertinetto, for instance, has claimed that improvisation, I'm quoting, suspends the divide between art and life, exhibits, exhibits art as life or reality, where well, life means what is spontaneous, life means what is spontaneous. Improvisation is authentic by definition, reality that appears as art. There are many other examples of organic discourses on improvisation, both from musicians and theorists. Improvisation as a natural object of living being, improvisation as an entity without a human author. In many of these examples, we see what David Toop has called the romance of becoming natural. Uh, just to put uh, some examples, John Thorne, for instance, in the introduction of one of his uh, volumes of Arcana series, uh, Johnson, after having stated in openly romantic terms the exceptionality of the improviser's task, says, a composition can actually write itself. Music creates itself at some kind of places of transcendence. Or Gavin, Gavin Briars, I let the form compose itself, letting the music compose itself, and so on. The point is that all these remarks share the same animism as romantics, Schenker, Cage, and Boulet show. Finally, at least, Alvin Curran is more explicit about the religious tinge of this musical discourse. Alvin Curran says, there is no question in my mind that as professional musicians, we feel a societal 
role, not unlike that of dedicated religious leaders. Just uh, to conclude, these kind of assertions, many of them not metaphorical at all, deserve, of course, serious, serious attention. Because, in fact, I would like to think that despite all this supernatural naturalism, the musical material doesn't evolve spontaneously, spontaneously by itself. It is particularly hard to accept that there is a natural place where the material should, should go because it naturally, or rather supernaturally, wants to go. I guess that under some of these issues underlies the old prestige of priesthood. After all, to house a superior entity speaking through you has always been an effective method of becoming an individual more valuable than a simple mortal. But if this was, were true, this movement of rejection of authorship this claim of religion or, thought, or, or that sidestep in order to let the sounds organize themselves and so on wouldn't be a gesture of modesty as it is sold sometimes, but of vanity and narcissism, as Richard Taruskin and uh, other authors have pointed out. I think the improviser Fred Fried has put it right. I quote, sometimes, said Fred Fried, the music becomes a seamless, breathing entity that appears to have a life of its own beyond the intentions of its makers. Such moments often lead to talk of channeling a higher force, of acting as a conduit for spiritual and healing power. And he concludes, this usually strikes me as a kind of false humility. Also, as I have tried to show in some relevant aspects of our discourses about improvisation. There's a clear lineage from romanticism to free improvisation. This combination of naturalness and non-authorship claims has been sometimes a way to assert a certain status of exceptionality. Uh, remember the previous quote of Alessandro Bertinetto. Improvisation, says the Italian philosopher, improvisation is authentic by definition. But how should we make sense of this exceptional authenticity? Certainly there has been in the last decades a solid and often politically charged cult of authenticity in some or music studies, according to which the artificial, the theatrical, the, the non-natural has been seen, have been seen as flaws. Authenticity has become a powerful category, a criterion of value that have, has achieved and a status of a kind of validating label. The natural is authentic, the artificial is not. The problem is that all authenticity in, or intended naturalness is always itself theatrical. Another aesthetic device, again, authentic pastorals don't exist. Therefore, the naturalness of improvisation would be, at best, a kind of Kantian pastoral, that is to say another welcome product of human artifice. Thank you.